This video is presented to you by Physics for Students. To know more, please visit us at physicsforstudents.com. Dear friends, my name is Shonak and I am your host for this podcast, The Saint of Mathematics. Welcome to the fourth episode. Over the mountains and over the waves, under the fountains and under the graves, under floods that are deepest, which Neptune obey, over rocks that are steepest, love will find out the way. When there is no place for the glowworm to lie, when there is no space for receipt of a fly, when the midge dares not venture, lest herself fast she lay, if love comes, he will enter and will find out the way. You may esteem him a child for his might, or you may deem him a coward for his flight. But if she whom love doth honour be concealed from the day, set a thousand guards upon her, love will find out the way. You may train the eagle to stoop to your fist, or you may invigil the phoenix of the east, the lioness. You may move her to give over her prey, but you'll never stop a lover, he will find out the way. If the earth it should part him, he would gallop it over. If the seas should overthwart him, he would swim to the shore. Should his love become a swallow, through the air to stray, love will lend wings to follow and will find out his way. There is no striving to cross his intent. There is no contriving his plots to prevent. But if once the message greet him that his true love doth stay, if death should come and meet him, love will find out the way. For Perelman, love came through seclusion and dedication. For him, his love found its way through years of study, research and perseverance. As has been said, 99% perspiration and 1% inspiration. For a genius like Perelman, it was also not an exception. The thousand guards that were set on him were the history of failures for proving the conjecture. The untrodden path which was an obstacle for him, still love found out its way. Three long years have passed and Perelman's internship in America seems to be going quite well. He caught several prestigious positions in universities, he had earned money, got a driving license and life seems to be rolling on its own way. Life is a roller coaster. There are surprises that are always waiting for us at every nook and corner. All we need to do is look around and have an open mind. For Perelman, the meeting with Richard Hamilton seems to change the course of his life. The strange relation between both of them never culminated at a single point. It is still unknown whether the duo met or Newton met Halley, Einstein met Eddington, and here the meeting between Perelman and Hamilton fosters the future of mathematics in a way which we are yet to discover. In 1982, Richard Hamilton, 
now of Columbia University, proposed a possible strategy for proving the famous Poincare conjecture. Start with any lumpy space and then let it flow towards a uniform one. The result would be a tidy geometrized space. To guide the flow, Hamilton proposed a geometric evolution equation modeled after the heat equation of physics and named it Ricci flow in honor of Gregorio Ricci Curbastro, an early differential geometer. In Ricci flow, regions of high curvature tend to diffuse out into the regions of lower curvature until the space has equal curvature throughout. Hamilton's strategy works perfectly on 2D surfaces. Slender necks always expand in three-dimensional spaces. However, Ricci flow can run into snags. Neck sometimes pinch off, separating the space into regions with different uniform geometries. Although Hamilton did a great deal of pioneering work on Ricci flow, he could not tame the singularities. Much was achieved, but Hamilton reached an impasse when he could not show that the manifold could not snap into pieces under the flow. One day he read a paper by Richard Hamilton and found he was stuck in a problem and cannot further proceed. Hamilton was stuck in a problem which mathematicians called the singularity, a point at which a mathematical object is not defined. He has designed something called Ricci flow, which was the centrifugal force behind the conjecture. However, he could not solve out the problems with singularities. Perelman wrote to Hamilton that he thinks he could solve it. Hamilton did not reply. For Perelman, it meant yes. Grigory Perelman headed towards St. Petersburg, where he could dedicate himself in solving the problem. When he arrived, his father has left and her sister would soon be moving to Israel. Not one, not two, seven long years, he shut himself from all his jobs, all his occupations, all his friends and relatives. He was obsessed with the idea of proving the problem, the Poincare conjecture. As we shall see, Perelman never went forward to prove the conjecture. Rather, the proof came alongside with much greater achievements. The solitude for seven long years served as salvation for what he was seeking. It was not easy to dedicate someone to such a problem. He has earned some money, savings from the US, so now he can concentrate on his work. For him, nothing can be purer than mathematics. Mathematicians have the highest knowledge of ethics and hence the best morality that could manifest its form is in mathematics. Perelman never faced a problem that was more challenging than this. He locked himself up, devoid of any external disturbances, and did the mathematics. The world for years had been waiting for a solution for the most difficult problem in mathematics. Termed as the Millennium Problem by the Clay Mathematical Institute, it challenged the world's best brains. Perelman worked silently at his home, stayed with his mother, and no one knew what he did. Since 1995, when he left the US, most of his fellow mathematicians have forgotten him, including Gang Tian, who drove him around the streets. For others, he was almost a dwindling star in the lost horizon. Perelman never forgot Richard Hamilton, and the day when he met. He was working on his roads and improved his work, which could earn him the greatest title, the greatest honor, and the greatest fame. On November 11, 2002, Perelman visits the website arxiv.org and submits his paper, The Entropy Formula for the Ricci Flow and its Geometric Applications. 
It was brief, 39 pages, written in English, and signs his name as Grisha Perelman. The world of mathematics went into a state of utter pandemonium. First, the proof was too short, difficult to understand. Second, submitting a proof that too, solving a millennium problem over the internet seemed a foolish idea. Gang Tian was in his office at MIT when he received Perelman's email. He and Perelman had been friendly in 1992 when they were both at New York University and had attended the same weekly math seminar at Princeton. I immediately realized its importance, Tian said of Perelman's paper. Tian began to read the paper and discuss it with colleagues who were equally enthusiastic. Tian wrote to Perelman asking him to lecture on his paper at MIT. Colleagues at Princeton and Stony Brook extended similar invitations. Perelman accepted them all and was booked for a month of lectures beginning in April 2003. In April 2003, Perelman visited the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Princeton University, Stony Brook University, Columbia University, and New York University to give short series of lectures on his work and to clarify some details for experts in the relevant fields. He could not stand the reporters, neither he could withstand cameras, and it happened like that. Perelman's April lecture tour was treated by mathematicians and by the press as a major event. Among the audience at his talk at Princeton were John Ball, Andrew Wiles, John Forbes Nash Jr. The audience was astonished as Perelman said nothing about the conjecture. He was opening new gates in geometry. The audience was silent. They stared in awe, expecting to prove the conjecture, but the Russian never mentioned anything about that. The conjecture was just a small case that he proved along the way. By mid-July, Perelman submitted his final two papers on the internet. Ritchie flow with surgery on three manifolds and finite extinction time for the solutions to the Ricci flow on certain three manifolds. The mathematical world was shaken. Could this be the answer to the millennium problem? Or is it still flawed? The history of this proof was flawed for years. Many mathematicians have tried to prove it, but failed. Tracing back, we find that in 1982, Michael Friedman proved the Poincaré conjecture in four dimensions. However, the problem persisted in proving with three dimensions. Perelman did not speak about his proof to anyone. As Professor Andrew Wiles walked in seclusion, yet he discussed with some of his colleagues, Gregory did not have anyone to speak. Would the proof have been flawed, he would have been humiliated in the public. In the world of mathematics, the big brain started to think about this proof. He is known to be a great mathematician, so the great brains thought of validating the proof and find an answer to which Perelman has given. The task was arduous, heavy, and involved a lot of fine brains to indulge. The first team was headed by Bruce Kleiner and John Lott, and the other by John Morgan and Gang Tian. It required many hours of studying complex calculations, patience, structures, and modifications. His proof embraced several fields of mathematics, the Ricci-Hamilton flow, Thurston's geometrization conjecture, the Alexandrov geometry, all these required immense hours of intensive study which the team started on validating his proof.
Life is as tedious as a twice told tale, vexing the dull ear of a drowsy man. So, that's it. I hope you enjoyed hearing this episode of The Saint of Mathematics. I will be back next week with another part of this podcast. Do let me know your feedback and reaction in the comment box and don't forget to like and subscribe. This is Seanok signing off from Physics for Students. Goodbye and stay happy.